We'll go ahead and get started now with our afternoon program. We've got a session now on governance, inequality, and growth, domestic consequences of illicit financial flows. The subtitle to this would be, Why Do We Care About Illicit Financial Flows? To talk about that, we have Olav Unstol from the Norwegian Embassy, Leonardo Bonamacqui from the State University of Rio de Janeiro, and our, mod our moderator for this session will be Roberto Fend from the Centro Brasileiro de Relaciones Internacionales. And I will introduce Roberto and turn it back over to him. So Roberto is the executive director of the Brazilian Center for International Relations, acronym of SEBRI in Brazilian, which is a prestigious think tank here in Rio de Janeiro. He has chaired the International Affairs Committee of the American Chamber of Commerce of Rio de Janeiro, the Brazilian Association of Foreign Trade, and the Trade Council of Federation of Commerce of the State of Sao Paulo. He's also served as the Superintendent of Studies and Research Center, Foundation for Foreign Trade Studies, and a Professor of Economics at the University of Sao Paulo. And he is a oh, and he also teaches at the Graduate School of Economics for FGV. So without further ado, I will turn it over to him. And for those of you who need caffeine or water, we still have that in the back. So, Roberto. You hear me? OK, I, I can hear myself. Um, well, our panel, as was mentioned before, will be on governance, inequality, and growth, domestic consequences of illicit flows. On my left is Olaf Lundstall. He's a counselor for energy and oil at the Norwegian Royal Norwegian Embassy here in Brazil. Mr. Lundstall works in Brasilia. He's a graduate of economics, business and economic history from the University of Oslo, the Norwegian School of Economics and the London School of Economics. Um, on my right is Mr. Leonardo Bulamaki, who is currently professor and research scholar at the State University of Rio de Janeiro, UERJ for the Brazilians. He was formerly a senior program officer at the Ford Foundation. And very appropriately for this panel, he was at that time in charge of reforming global financial governance initiative. Without much ado, uh, we'll get started. Uh, Mr. Lundstall will have the floor first, and then I'll pass the floor to Leonardo Bulamaki. Thank you very much. First, uh, thank you to GFI and also to the co-hosters for, for the invitation. Uh, I must admit that there is some kind of long-term relationship also between GFI and Norway. And of course, today I also represent government of Norway as, as I work for Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There has been a long uh, collaboration in this topic, and I will come a bit back to it. And I've had the pleasure of working with Raymond and other of his colleagues also in Africa. I recently came to Brazil, just been here three weeks, after spending nine years in Africa, including five years in Zambia, uh, where I worked most intensively on the issue that was mentioned by Raymond earlier. So I'll possibly come back to that also a little bit. But let me, let me jump into the presentation, see if I can, uh, see if I can uh, move on. I will... I will, my talk will hopefully be quite brief, and I will try to focus to put, I think, some of the overarching elements for the discussion out. Although, to some extent, I realize that many, for many of you, this will perhaps be repetition, and to some extent, it was mentioned in the first session today. But I think it's important to sort of to, to put the context of the discussion, also when we look at the domestic scene, because 
So the first slide here is basically, I mean, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about IFF, tax havens, and development? And I will go a little bit into actually, although the topic is more to the developing economies, also dwelling in a little bit on the developed economies, why also developed economies are concerned about this issue. Um, and it basically has to do with uh, that there is a very clear indication and now increasingly more and more empirical evidence as well from the developed economies uh, that the issues and, and basically the connection between secrecy jurisdictions, tax havens, and, and illicit financial flows or capital flights and challenges of, uh, of, of development and inequality are, are very large and they are also linked to overall development issues also in the Western world. We can discuss perhaps if it's time, but I mean there's no doubt that there are close links also with financial crisis and, and also ups and downs in the global economy and in, in economies in different regions linked to this topic. And it's interesting just to put on the table a few, few data here that sort of puts why this is so important. And I've taken, uh, taken some data from uh, Nicholas Jackson, who has written a very influential book on this topic, looking into, from the point of view of UK, but also at the global level, the issue of tax havens. So just to put it out there, I mean, 50% of world trade today goes through tax havens. So this is, they are involved in, in, in a very large part of the, of the international transactions that goes on, both in trade and in services. 50% of all banking assets are held in offshore accounts. 30% of all FDI go through offshore accounts, and Raymond mentioned this link to, to China, but you can also say the same about India, and actually most, you know, the, the biggest foreign investor in India, wh where does the money come from? It comes from Mauritius, for example. Uh, and the balance sheet, again, Raymond mentioned, of small island countries is above 18 trillion US dollar or about one third of world GDP. So this is not, we're not talking about marginal or part of the global economy or part of the capitalist system. This is, this is the heart of the whole system, the way it has evolved. And it is bigger than it has ever been. I mean, even if we talk about early, early 20th century that you had inequality and global economy that perhaps was similar to what we are evolving towards now, never before has it been with the relevant, the relative importance as it has today. Uh, so for Norway, why is Norway interested in this? Norway is a major partner in many countries when it comes to development cooperation. And we have also realized, I think, through different governments that we've had that it's important to think differently about financing uh, development and it's also this big paradox that is now brought up by GFI and by other authors before as well to some extent Paul Collier for example writing quite extensively on capital flight earlier on and we had the Monterey conference in Mexico on financing for development and Norway really got engaged in this and supported GFI in the early phase still supports GFI uh, and wrote actually a government uh, white paper on it as well in 2009 that became quite influential on tax havens and development. Where we brought up also some of the available information. We also brought up a lot of policy proposals that have been implemented to some extent in Norway and also supporting regional and global and national initiatives. I mentioned I recently came from Tanzania. In Tanzania, we have actually a project also supported where we work with the central bank to look at illicit financial flows as well. Uh, and we have uh, also supported work that Raymond and GFI has been involved in with the high level panel in Africa as well, as well as the global task force uh, uh, and work through OECD and work through World Bank and IMF and several other bodies as well. So uh, why, as I mentioned, if you, there were questions earlier this morning also about the developed economies. W what is sort of the engagement here? Why, what is the access to the realities for developed economies here? And we have, as many of you probably have, might have read or at least have heard about, there is a recent work that has created a lot of discussion. But this also has come on the back of a discussion that has emerged for the last 10 to 15 years, at least, if not more. 
And it is that we see a trend throughout most of the Western world or developed economies of rising inequality. So the last two to three decades, according to documentation by Thomas Piketty in his famous book, Capitalism in the 21st Century, you see an inequality rising that is, he is comparing it with the situation before the First World War. Uh, but, and the basic argument for the Western world from his side is that it's linked to the sharing of the gains uh, between labor and capital, that they are becoming more and more unequal. There are other studies also by French think tanks showing similar things for Europe, for example. So there is increasing evidence and empirics backing up this situation. And of course, it's linked also to the global financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis, which are still to some extent ongoing, with many countries struggling with the aftermath and the problems that accumulated. Where basically what we have seen is that through this crisis now, what has emerged is, is uh, also a situation where you have actually ended up with a big, big problem uh, caused to a large extent in the financial sectors and, and uh, well, to some extent by public investment as well. But you have actually had the situation where you ended up after the crisis with a more unequal situation than before. And who is left with the bill? Well, it's basically the governments and also the, the, the big part of the population. So a lot of what is lost in the discussion often in Europe, for example, where I come from, is that a lot of people think that it was mainly due to irresponsible fiscal policy in Europe that they got into this, this big mess. To some extent that is true, but to a large extent it's not true actually, because a big part of the crisis now and the big debt that has accumulated on the hands of the government is actually that they have bailed out uh, investments from the private sector that went wrong, basically. So if you look at the fiscal soundness of Ireland, for example, or even many Mediterranean countries before the crisis hit, many of them were running surpluses for numerous years right up to the crisis hit. So, so this issue of inequality, like was mentioned before also, that there was a lot of capital, and I mentioned the numbers on the last, on the slide before, a lot of capital, obviously some is from the south to the north that is accumulated in tax havens, but a big chunk of money also is money that is taken out of the Western world into tax havens, and then is actually not even in the numbers like Raymond was alluding to this morning. <laughs> Everyone is astounded by the numbers that Thomas Piketty is, is putting out, but actually he's not really including full on the numbers that are, are in the tax havens. And when we look at how big those numbers are, we realize that surely they mean that the situation is even much worse than what he has described. So he's ba he broadly leaves untreated, for example, the offshore economy that has increased, as I said, to unprecedented levels in the last few decades. And he doesn't discuss either, which is understandable, that a, lot, a big part of that boost in the offshore economy comes from a, a growing and large net transfer from the south to the north. Uh, so that is also sort of an emerging discussion in Norway, I think in many other countries. I will come back a little bit to international initiatives, hopefully, on this. A G8 has their three T's now under the UK and, and now soon to come German chairmanship, they're looking at trade, transparency, and tax. And why is that? I mean, it's also purely for selfish reasons, because it has to do with that they, they have a, a huge debt on the public hands or on the government hands, and they have a fiscal deficit and a, a fiscal problem, while at the same time there are big amounts of money lying unutilized or, or, or not taxed or that is not contributing and could easily solve big parts of this problem. Yeah. So, for the emerging economies, which was, I was supposed to talk more about, um, what are the issues? I will not go so much into sort of all the human rights aspects and all the social aspects that maybe it was expected I should have done, but it's from my point of view, fairly obvious, although we can discuss, and there was some criticism also from the person who comes after me now, questioning whether really that funding would be available for development. Uh, 
but I think it's true in many countries where you have large outflows. And I can clearly say, coming from Africa, having worked nine years in Africa, that this outflow is a major problem. And I think in many of these countries, why is it a major problem? Yes, because they have the basic argument for aid, for example, was the savings gap, you know, the savings investment gap. This is, I mean, old old time development economics. This is why we started doing development economics in the 50s and the 60s. And the, the rationale for aid as well. And it's true, I mean, the, there is a huge gap in parts of Africa. Uh, and there have been a lot of studies and estimates. So th there is a lost financing opportunity for development. In some cases, it's much more extreme. In parts of Africa, it's much more extreme in relative terms. Um, and you have actually then profitable private and public investment uh, that could have been happening. Part of it, as Raymond was saying through that, some would have been taxed, some would have been then private that could have been utilized in the country itself. And we have looked at the numbers, of course. Uh, so these are not small numbers. We are talking about up to one, one trillion US dollar per year. So as, men as Raymond mentioned, this exceeds net legal capital inflow to the developing world and many times ODA. And we also have a situation, as I mentioned, where these numbers are getting worse. So we, we have a situation where the gaps are increasing. So the outflows compared to what was really the gap or what was needed to reach certain growth levels or to have money to fund social investments and also productive investment from the government side, the gaps are in some cases increasing. Uh, there was a recent report by GFI on East Africa that showed clearly, I think, for many countries that these gaps are growing and there is a big underutilized potential here. So the net effect, here is one study. I work quite closely with a number of economists uh, under the something called the African Economic Research Consortium based in Nairobi. It's an aggregation of African economists from all over Africa that are now currently working on uh, publishing a book on the illicit financial flows uh, led by Leons and Dikumana and James Boyce and also other professors of economics from Nigeria. So one of the economists in that group has currently is going to publish uh, an article. And this basically shows that the net effect of illicit financial flows on growth and poverty has been estimated to, to have, uh, it could have, if that money would have been kept in the countries, according to his calculations, he also has developed a number of models linked to this, could have been of such magnitude if you assume that the investment had a similar type of efficiency than other type of investment spreads in the, in the public and private sector, it could have had meant that Sub-Saharan Africa could have reached MDG1, namely the poverty goal, within 2015 as a whole. As most of you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is not on track to reach that goal. Some countries are making progress, but as a whole, the region is lagging behind quite a lot. So what about Brazil? Um, where is Brazil in this picture? I must be careful, I'm very new to Brazil, so I will try to, but I'm, I'm looking, reading quite a lot these days, so I'll try to put up some thoughts here. Uh, for Brazil, uh, I've come across some numbers, for example, by Tax Justice Network from last year. They have an estimation, and that's a study that was done by James Henry, former chief economist of McKinsey. Uh, he had an estimate in a global study he did that around 520 billion US dollar of assets coming from Brazil or belonging to Brazil uh, were in secrecy jurisdictions. So that's quite an interesting number. Uh, Brazil is, as was mentioned, the seventh highest cumulative IFF outflow among developing countries in the last decade. And then you have the situation in the economy, of course, that many of you know much more about than me, but increasing productivity challenges in the overall economy, accompanied also by low levels of domestic savings and investments. Brazil on average, at least in the last decade, has been much lower than many other benchmark countries in the region, and not to talk about Asia. I mean, currently between 17 to 18 percent of GDP. Several studies by the IMF, by others as well, have estimated what the level of investment would need to be at in order to sustain growth at certain levels. 
So this, this is clearly an issue uh, that is there, that there is a lack of saving and a lack of investment, probably also for reasons then in the enabling framework and in the whole thing that we can get into discussing. But there's no doubt that if you look at, for example, infrastructure, there's a stock number there that was from a McKinsey report 2012. The infrastructure stock of Brazil was only 17% of GDP compared to benchmark countries around 50 to 75. Investment in infrastructure in 2013, only 1.5% of GDP. It's an interesting number. It's close to the number of estimated illicit financial flows out of Brazil in the same year. Uh, and then there are estimates from, uh, from University here of Rio also looking at what would it take to really lift Brazil up to the level of infrastructure development that, that you would expect considering its level of development. Uh, you're talking about very, very big numbers and many, many times the current plans of the government. And of course, right now, 2014, Brazil is in officially in technical recession. So, and with decreasing levels of growth in the last few years. And I mentioned already that estimated uh, IFF was about the same as investment in infrastructure in 2012. And I think no one disagrees that level of infrastructure investment needs to be significantly higher. So yes, the money is needed. Uh, of course, if it would go to the right place, it's a discussion of enabling framework and policies. So outlook. I'll try to wrap up and just leave a few things here that will be more discussed in the next session, I guess. But if you look at the international picture, what, what is the outlook? The risk is what I had commented and many have commented in the first session earlier this morning that the trend is upwards. So if you look at the risk scenario, I mean, currently the way things are going by all, by all signs, one would expect the numbers to increase. So one would expect financial flows, illicit ones and licit to go up and inequality also to go up. This is basically what Piketty says in his book as well. He doesn't believe that it will stabilize or go down in the, in the near future. Uh, but what are some of the opportunities? There is a lot of international and more and more and increasingly an uh, agreement that this is a problem. It's not just an esoteric problem or a financial sort of side thing of the financial system. It's a systemic problem that has to be dealt with in a different way than before. Uh, so there are a lot of initiatives, G8, uh, G20 as well, OECD is starting a lot of work on this and there's a lot of attention at the political level. IMF is starting a big, big research program on this as well. Uh, UN and also some of the BRICS countries are doing very interesting things in practice, including Brazil is doing very innovative things when it comes to the issue of transfer pricing and in terms of moving away from the traditional uh, approach within the OECD guidelines, for example, on arm length deal, uh, arm, 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 arm length practices to deal with the transfer pricing issue. Um, and then there are other things that are under some of these initiatives, automatic exchange of information, Brazil has pushed for this, extended country by country reporting, and global financial system scrutiny. There is some emerging discussion on this. Question is whether there is willingness to go far enough and to go structural. The answer is probably no, <laughs> because it's very political. But could, for example, the BRICS, as was mentioned this morning, or other groups that are growing in importance, push this discussion somehow. I think there are like-minded countries in the Western world as well, and many multilateral institutions are willing to look at this uh, in a profoundly different way. Um, so I think needed, I will say the same for Bastille, I think what is needed is actually a new global and national approach to regulation and taxing of international business. This is what is on the underlying the whole thing. We can try to patch part of the system is it really going to make a difference? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the numbers are not, not promising. Um, and there are quite a few alternative thoughts and ways of how to tax differently. But it would require, of course, an unprecedented, perhaps, um, agreement at a global level between a lot of very strong interests and diverging interests to some extent as well. So for Brazil, outlook, how is it? 
the risks will increase in Brazil as well, no doubt. I mean, I talked about the needed investment in infrastructure in other parts of the economy. Uh, Brazil, in many ways, is at the path fork in the road to some extent. I mean, many have talked about the middle income trap. You have gone to a certain extent with a certain model and approach. Uh, there will have to be very large investments, no doubt, if you're going to reboost the growth. So there will be a rapid increase in infrastructure investment. Typically, those have a high risk of corruption and a high risk of illicit flows as well. This is the experience all over the world, including in Norway, where there are several big corruption cases going at the moment. And then pre-sale development, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars in investment. This as well, high risk area. So I wouldn't really expect the risk to go down or the numbers to go down unless you are doing something completely different or completely better than most other countries that have been in a similar situation. Opportunity, the good news is that I believe in my very limited knowledge of Brazil is that there are some very innovative <laughs> initiatives in Brazil and there is also some political will to try to do things differently. So I mentioned the approach to transfer pricing and I think also there is new legislation coming, some has arrived already and we will see now how this can be implemented and I think also what could be much needed is, as was mentioned this morning, to really use the brick window and to work actively with, with a coalition of strong enough partners to influence really the new rules that are needed. You need a new approach to in taxation of international business, that I firmly believe. And there is research going on. I am on the research board, research board of International Center on Tax and Development. There is, they are doing new and innovative research, I believe, with many partners and, and countries. Uh, on some uh, that could bring out some interesting uh, findings. Thank you. I will stay seated while I speak. I think this gives us a little bit more of a informal way of exchanging instead of just going to the podium. Uh, and um, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, it's a great report and it's revealing I think a uh, couple of interesting uh, sessions and a lot of interesting interventions. Uh, so I think we're, we're in, in a very, very nice path. Uh, the title I gave to the notes that I wrote to myself just to have an idea where I could be starting from. Uh, title is Nuclear Power and financial systems both have the capacity to blow up the world. And I think he's into something when he says that, okay? So this should be very much in the front of the regulators and the central bankers nowadays. So the growth of illicit capital flows, as we could see from this report and for the past reports that Raymond and his team put together, very nice reports. Uh, the, the growth of illicit capital flows over the last, I did three decades, but especially the last decade maybe, uh, and not only in Brazil, all over the place, I think this is one of the most telling manifestations of uh, something that I will call maybe sort of an audaciously, a structural change that globalized finance and globalized capitalism brought to us. I'm referring to financialization plus private interest driven re-regulation. People used to call this deregulation. I have a problem with that uh, word because I happen to believe that there is no such a thing as deregulation. Deregulation, complete deregulation means anarchy, means there are no rules, you can do whatever you want. What we have is always re-regulation. So the question is, you regulate for the public interest or you let private interest write the rules that will be applied to them? And I think this is what exactly the, 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 the sort of environment, institutional and legal environment that we're living through. So financialization, by financialization, I mean not only the growth in the size and in the profits of the financial system, but more than that, I would say 
the industrialization of finance and the financialization of industry in the sense that finance now doesn't really just loans make loans for a few clients or even like a bunch of clients it packs their securities and they sell them all over the world so that's industrialization of finance right and on the other side of the equation or the coin well private corp uh, non-financial corporations all got financialized stocks buybacks and other things and the things that you uh, describe in terms of misinvoicing and all, all this refers to ways to avoid paying taxes and ways to increase their gains, which not necessarily or frequently have nothing to do with getting more productive, improving productivity. So that's what I, I, I mean when I talk about, when I refer to those things. So uh, the growth of illicit capital flows and licit capital flows as well, I think illustrates the point uh, in a sense that it falls in a very complex interaction among domestic and international supervision and regulation, tax authorities and tax rules, of course, financial regulators and tax shelters, which my colleague just mentioned, and I will come back to this point in a moment. So the obvious fact I will say, uh, I would say, is that the report, as the report titles, uh, the, ti the title indicates, they are, and I will say, a potential, a potential hidden resource. Well, abundant, again, potential tax revenues in a world that, that's starved for tax revenue. That's a big point. And, well, those tax revenues, could be doing what? Well, they could be doing a, a whole lot of things. Raymond mentioned that. They could be uh, funding, helping to fund development, R&D, social programs, uh, poverty alleviation, all, all, the, all, all those things combined. There, there, there is no lack of uses for them, but maybe I think there is, ins they are insufficient, there is insufficient understanding uh, in terms of what is at the bulk of the problem, which I will suggest it's a big regulatory flaw which gets us I think to the heart of how the financial system works and that was I think my point when I raised the question to Raymond in uh, earlier this morning so uh, the obvious fact uh, in terms of what adding to what I, I, I just said is that those flows they not only subtract from public interest related uh, uses, but they also add to purely speculative gambling activities. And that's why I mentioned the potential, the potential of a very negative type of multiplier. If you multiply the operations you do with options and derivatives, that's clearly not a good thing. If the money stays, but the financial, financial regulation in the place where or, be it in Brazil, be it in Russia, be it whatever, if you have crappy financial regulation, that could be a big problem. A lot of money that came to the U.S., by the way, uh, uh, during 2005, 2004, 2006, 2007, it went there, what for? For productive investments. We know what happened with that money, right? It helped to inflate a tremendous financial bubble. So not necessarily liquidity equals investment, productive investment, or even uh, responsible or sane consumption. Because again, when we look at the, okay, the housing boom and the way the housing boom was managed, this was consumption, yes, but it, also, it was also at the same time crazy indebtedness filled by over leverage and again we were not well the u.s was in terrible shape shape in terms of managing that and the whole world felt the blow so again the way the financial system works both domestically <coughs> and internationally speaking 
it's, I think, at the heart of the problem in terms of this whole thing of illicit, illicit, illicit capital flows, illicit capital flows, and the way they link or do not link to develop. But before trying to uh, close or wrap up offering some comments, I, I won't say, please, I won't say I will offer any answers to that, but some comments. Before doing that, let me just take a small step back and get a little bit into the, what I think I will call the problem of the global, right? Um, and this, this also marks uh, a lot of my trajectory at the Ford Foundation. When I began there in 2006, it was, I was running a portfolio called, originally was called uh, Global Economic Governance, and then after the crisis, it turned to be reforming global financial governance for the obvious reasons. And uh, I was very much enthusiastic about the global, the, potentiali the potential and the potentialities of some sort of global whatever, global governance mechanisms, go global governance organizations, glo you, you, you name it. Uh, what happened after, I don't know, six years at Ford? Um, I, I stayed eight years, but maybe after four or five, I was already scratching my head in terms of, okay, what exactly is the potential of the global, the global in terms of fixing the mess that we're in the middle of. And by now, I have to say, I have much less faith in the global than I used to have when I started there. Some reasons, I'm not obviously not going to be uh, exhausting anything, but if we go and see the financial reforms and the financial the projects for financial reforms that are in place. So, for example, uh, the Vickers report, the Lee Cunning report, the Vickers report, basically UK. Lee Cunning report is regional, but it's, it's EU, right? Or what we have that's like the most, that has, that has more meat into it, Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank bill, mm -hmm. is US. It's not a global thing. It's basically a US sort of regulatory reform. Right, so we have an exception, one exception there, which is the Stiglitz report, the UN Dash Stiglitz report of 2009. But this is the one that is less discussed, and it's also what I think we have to say. We have to. I would agree with someone if someone said, "Well, but the Stiglitz report is quite general." Yes, yes, it is quite general, but it's also truly global. It addresses the problem from a global perspective, but still is just the beginning. And it didn't fare well. It, it's not one of the most discussed things. It's more or less, it passed. It was discussed when it was released. I don't know, maybe six months after, nobody talked about that report anymore. So what's the reason? I'm not sure. Maybe because some of the ideas that are there are nice, but it, tremendously difficult to implement, even to begin to think about implementation. So they know very much the what. They don't very much. They don't know very much the hows, how to do it. So when we move uh, from debates or proposals from the from from that to the facts, uh, I think it's fair to say we're six years after Lemon, right? After Lemon Brothers, I think it's 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 fair to say that the situation we're in is far from encouraging. Uh, I think the banking, well, I think we know, the banking system is more, not less concentrated than it was, okay? Uh, global ban banks continue <coughs> to do pretty much whatever they want. They have a ton of money which has, was given to them free by the Fed, and they're basically what? Really not doing anything. Not at <laughs> Most of all, they are not lending productively. So. Is it it's sitting there or is being used is being used to to gamble again? So that's not exactly exciting. So and they don't need to lend to productive activities. Why? Because profits are booming anyway. So the incentives to do that are simply not there. Again, 
the way the financial system works counts a lot. So if we look at who are the real de facto regulators nowadays, still are the credit rating agencies. They are the ones, they messed up royally <laughs> all the time, but they are still doing their ratings and a lot of uh, corporations and even governments, when they are downgraded, they have to sell some of the investments because the investments are not triple A or something like that. And who, who is on top of that? Credit rating agencies, which were completely demoralized by the crisis itself. But what exactly changed in that? So that's the landscape where uh, illicit capital flows boomed the last 10 years, the last <coughs> eight years, the last four years. So given that background, the first question that I want to raise for discussion is the following. Well, is, the, is it the case, should, should we be thinking that the case uh, is that not much can be done outside national borders, meaning again, the global dimension is not really very, one that is very effective in terms of one is not able to manage whatever you think, especially finance on a global scale. And if this is correct, if this is true, so then the full question I think becomes the following. What are the prospects for addressing this imbalance between global markets global financial markets especially, and the lack of a proper institutional framework to discipline them. I think that question is still there. Not much was done in terms of resolving that. There's not, not a very clear or, or smart answer to, to, that, to that one. So if the global in itself, is, if, if, if global governance is much more and especially, again, global financial governance is much more difficult to accomplish than some of us think it was, should we be concluding that financial globalization, after all, is unmanageable? It cannot be managed. And if so, it should be reversed. Less financial globalization should be something in the works because you can't have global financial markets which are completely unmanageable if you can manage them, if you don't have the institutional apparatus to deal with them. So the logical response is, okay, then we have to reverse them. So that's something that I leave, it's a point that I leave for discussion. I'm sure that there will be people here that will not agree with me, but that's a point for discussion. The second thing, the se secondly, the question of and then I go, let me pu put together illicit and licit capital flows, both of them. Because Raymond, you said, well, I'm don't, I don't have a problem with the licit capital flows, the ones that go and they are legal. I have. Why do I have this problem? Because I think that the impact that capital flows, licit and illicit, the impact that the, the destabilizing impact that they have in terms of domestic policy space, in terms of the volatility of exchange rates. And by doing that, the imp their impact on interest rates, this is a problem. This is a real problem for development. Why? Because it creates a whole lot of uncertainties by creating financial volatility and eventually financial fragility. That's Minsky. I'm really being Minskyan here. So it gets in a way of development, the way I see it. But it's much less because this money represents a lack of savings. It doesn't. It doesn't because there's no savings glut. If you have credit, you have investment. You don't need to save first. The household needs to save first in order to expand. Banks can create money and especially treasuries and central banks, they do create money and after they do that, then they get the deposit. They don't need the deposits first to create mm -hmm. the money afterwards. So there's not a problem in that regard. 
So the question is financial volatility. So that I think is what for me is again the uh, the crux, the the, the 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 central point of, of, of the issue of the issue. And the question that follows that is obviously how are global regulators uh, dealing with that? And the, the response I don't think is thrilling, right? Um, let me jump to uh, just one episode that, uh, to give you an, illustra an illustration of, of the, that difficulty. This was in Jackson Hole at the Central Bankers Conference last year, right? Uh, where we had this famous paper by Ellen Ray from the London Business School, and where she was saying, well, the basic takeaway that she had was the choice is the following. One has to impose capital at Jackson Hole. So that was a really bold statement. Either you have to impose capital controls or you have to let the, you have to let the Federal Reserve run your economy, which is basically what you're doing. And apparently, this bold statement didn't cause any big storm among the U.S. participators. Uh, the then president, I don't know if he's still doing this to the president there, Dennis Lockhart was the, the Federal Reserve, uh, the Atlanta Federal Reserve uh, president. He told the press very bluntly this, we are there to set national policy for the betterment of the U.S. economy and do not have a lot of scope to go outside that set of considerations. And the Financial Times summarized that episode with the title, Central Bankers Have, have Given Up on Fixing Global Finance, which I think it was appropriate because what he was saying was basically, look, our problem is domestic. Even if, as I think we know, the Federal Reserve, the closest thing that we have from a global central bank. However, it's not a global central bank, it's the U.S. central bank, and its policies are domestically oriented. Otherwise, it will be, they will be even illegal. So against this orientation, the next question that I think I, I would like to suggest is how to build international cooperation on manage both licit and illicit capital flows uh, if the most powerful central bank of all has an explicitly domestically oriented uh, set of policies. How do you build international cooperation in a place like that? Uh, fourthly, and then I'll go back to the fiscal shelters. This is, I would say, so much important than people, people give them, uh, well, it's, it's, it's one of the most crucial elements in this whole thing. Why? Well, we all know, and my colleague here, Olaf, just uh, underlined all this, this combination, this deadly combination of fiscal shelters, of balance sheet operations, and their combinations, they are the perfect vehicles for illicit capital flows, as well as, as well for the licit, okay. Uh, tax avoidance, over leverage, etc. But the really interesting question is this. Why fiscal shelters are so much used? Why do they exist? And the answer is simple. Because they are legal. They are perfectly legal. So the question is this. Why fiscal shelters are legal? Everybody uses them. Why? Because they can. There is no problem in using them. Again, they are legal. So if one wants to get serious about anything in terms of global uh, regulation of capital flows, you have to have uh, capital controls as, as one of the most important pieces of macroeconomic management on one hand, and you have to close down fiscal shelters because they don't do any good for any of the things that we're thinking about. They just do harm for them. But again, they're legal, and just before we think again, oh, Cayman Islands, and there are other islands that they're, oh, the Caymans and the Jerseys, they're linked to other islands, Manhattan, the UK, etc. And don't forget Delaware. 
Okay? Mm -hmm. Don't forget Delaware. Not Cayman, not Jersey. Delaware, just inside the U.S., is a big fiscal shelter. Why on earth this is legal? So that, that's the kind of questions. So when we deal with illicit capital mm -hmm. flows, don't get the first African, African dictator that is there. This is not the problem. Problem is in Delaware, problem is in Wall Street. That's where the problem is. So let's be clear about that. And uh, just to wrap up and try to finish up, okay? Uh, when exactly tax authorities will begin to really cooperate with financial regulators? Because they don't, they don't cooperate. And I'll give you a very brief example, or I just meant I don't, I don't, I don't think I have time to, to do it. But this, the case of Enron is emblematic about that because Enron was reporting record, profit, record profits because he was using the mark-to-market -market rule that was allowed to them by financial regulators. On the other hand, the IRS, the U, American uh, tax authorities, were not taxing Enron at all. Why? Because from their perspective, Enron was not making any money. There, was, there were no profits to be taxed. But there were profits. They were showing up for financial regulators. They were not showing up. They didn't exist. They were reporting potential future profits as existing profits. The IRS knew that. Financial regulations apparently didn't. And they never talked to each other. So this is a big problem. When this is going to start happening? Because they don't talk. Those agencies don't talk to each other, and they should. And lastly, to close up, really, uh, regulatory capture. That's, again, another big problem, because regulators are often not very well paid. Sometimes they are not even well respected. In the US, they weren't. And the whole Reagan and post Reagan and, and Bushes, et cetera, not respected. Uh, and, of course, very easy to get captured if you have, I don't know, uh, all sorts of uh, perks and the next job and things like that. Not to mention ideological capture, which means everywhere, again, in 2014, every single uh, US and UK, whatever, Anglo-American universities are still teaching more or less the same things. Same things. The textbooks are the same. So light touch regulation, effective markets, efficient markets, etc. Remember, who got the, the Nobel Prize this year? Well, Schiller, which is against that, and Eugene Fama, the father of efficient markets. Very much schizophrenic. But this is how the Nobel Prize was distributed last year. Very much. So what I think we're facing, it's a very, a truly unholy alliance in between ideas and interests and the power of the financial industry. I'm, I'm done. So what, what I would like to suggest, and that's again a point for discussion, is that when we look at sort of the system that we have in place, I would call it a system of governance by lobbying. Lobbies are the one who exercise, the, who mobilize and exercise the governance. If this is correct, I would say illicit capital flows are just the tip of a much bigger iceberg, which is the problem of, after all, Western-style representative democracy. If representative democracy is there, but who really governs are the interests of the big corporations and the financial interests, can we really talk about true democracy? That's my final point, and I thank you, and I'm sorry that I went more, more than I should. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Leonardo. <laughs> you know, both of you have made my, my work tough, because usually the moderator would be uh, taking notes of whatever he disagrees and would throw the disagreements uh, on the, on the uh, 
of the people who, who made the statements. But I, I'm very sad to say that I agree with most of what was said in this panel. Um, just beginning with Eduardo's presentation, uh, I fully agree that uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Eduardo on the difficulties of avoiding capture of regulators by the regulator. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the difficulty of having any multilateral agreement on anything. You just look at the, uh, the trade agreements. We are on the verge of turning the World Trade Organization in a major and a huge dispute settlement organization, and that's all. Uh, and the same applies to uh, financial regulations and the regulation of capital flows. Most central banks, I don't know of any, any one central bank which has in its mission to help to fix problems of imbalances in the international market, in the national financial market. Usually the, the mission of a central bank is to preserve the value of domestic money, which is another problem, by the way, the existence of several different monies in the world. Some of them have an additional mission of pursuing price stability with preservation of economic growth as the, the Federal Reserve in the United States, but none of them has any mission to take care of financial imbalances on a world scale. So if such an institution doesn't exist, we shouldn't expect that these things would happen spontaneously. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit dissatisfied with the, the causes of, of the, the uh, illicit flows uh, discussed here, because I guess it, it has a lot to do with the size of the tax burden that individuals and firms have in their respective countries. Um, so uh, those tax havens, uh, as Eduardo mentioned, they, they serve the purpose of channeling resources from heavily taxed countries to lower taxed countries, and then to redistribute the money back uh, to where the, the return on investment given the institutional protection of investment uh, exists. Uh, I have a doubt, Olaf, with your presentation. Um, I had uh, the understanding that inequality in Brazil had been reduced dramatically, uh, especially during the, the two terms of President Lula. Mm. And you correlated, so to speak, uh, the increase in illicit financial flows from Brazil with the increase, or I understood it badly, uh, with the increase in inequality. So uh, I was puzzled, but maybe I understood it incorrectly. Uh, and when on a world scale, inequality is also being reduced. And it's being reduced dramatically because of this incredible growth in China, which was one of the poorest, or the poorest country number of people in the world, and, and in India. So inequality is going down. And on a world scale, uh, in Brazil, inequality is going down. And the figures uh, presented for illicit flows is not, they're not going down. So I, I would be tempted not to correlate uh, the two. But this is just a comment to provoke uh, questions and more comments. Uh, and I, I would like to, to, uh, to pass the word to the floor to, uh, to the audience to, for the questions. Please, whoever wants to intervene, uh, just give me the name and, and to whom you would like to address uh, the question. Please, the microphone. Microfone aqui na frente, por favor. Yes, senhor. First, uh, inequality is reducing is a kind of Simpson paradox. Because uh, you, if you calculate at global level, yes, it's reducing because of the China is growing. But if you calculate in every place except from Brazil, inequality is growing. So 
uh, it's, uh, I would say that's a bit unfair from the point of view that people that are living this inequality that's reducing in a global level. Um, the idea that the BRICS would do something to change this, I think that uh, I'm not sure if I, I would say that it, it drowned, it uh, disappeared uh, with the Ukraine or with uh, the solution in, with the crisis in Cyprus that uh, uh, was the first time that uh, the people that g get the capital there, their capital was destroyed. At other uh, situations, the state intervened and saved the wealth. But in Cyprus, they decide, oh, this wealth is not valid wealth. It was a tax haven that was, wasn't heaven anymore. <clears throat> I think that the, the idea, the, the proposal that uh, um, Russia, Russia should be expelled of SWIFT and uh, the things that are happening, like, for example, Argentina banned by a court in New York from the financial markets and started to do swaps in Yuan with China. That analyzes that some kind of split happening and uh, the, the, the idea that we can have a, a global solution, a negotiated global solution, it's not there anymore. So I believe that some, taking the, the point of all of, I, I believe that's that's some kind of sp uh, uh, unsolvable split happening. That uh, this uh, the, this globalization, financial globalization, we are living, they are it's about to dissolve by political problems. So I would like to see if perhaps if Leonardo see this point. The other thing in Brazil. We have a, a, an internal Maastricht. So the thing is, we have limits for the local levels of states to make uh, infrastructure investments. And we don't have, like China, that has some off sheets of balance structures that allow this kind of investment to be done. A point that I saw two times Albert Cato make here in Brazil. That's, a, that's the, the, the huge difference because uh, uh, the, um, we can't, for example, create an entity that would do the, the fast train between Rio and Sao Paulo because we can't create an off-balance uh, public uh, entity anymore. So that's the, the thing. We, 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 there are some more co uh, complicated things that the, um, the Lei de Responsabilidade Fiscal and the other kind of the, 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 the things that are in the agenda in Brazil that make it quite difficult to do. Well, we have uh, 10 more minutes. So what I'm planning to do is the following. I'll I'll have two more questions if there are two more uh, questions in the audience. Yeah. And then pass the, the floor to both of the speakers for replies. Any, any more questions, please? Uh, I'm Paulo Vrobel, uh, Leonardo. You've been quite pessimistic, in a way, in terms of your description of the impossibility of a global, you know, global way of dealing with, with finance. And uh, I think I made this point earlier that um, if we look at the post-recession re regulatory um, environment, it's, uh, it changed very little. I mean, it, in the margin, in the margin, there were some changes. 
But in the beginning, actually, the, the G20 was formed in a way uh, to, to partially to, to, to do with this issue, I mean, to, to, to look at finance from a broader aspect. But particularly your idea, your idea of financialization, which means the financialization of industry, the industrialization of finance, um, I think it's, 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 I agree entirely, but uh, do, you see, do you see any way where this conundrum could be moved from where we are? Very well. One more question, or is that all? Well, maybe I should uh, ask the floor first to all of you. you might uh, address, including my yes. my my comments at the yes. beginning, and the and the try to address the questions posed by the audience. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I think it's a, it's a very interesting discussion. Also, taking a lot of notes on my. Uh, my colleague here in his intervention, I fully agree, and I think you summed it up well. We seem to agree on a lot of the basic descriptions. Uh, I think, I mean, you, the question you posed a bit, I mean, is there anyone with the mandate to fix the global financial system uh, imbalances and causes? Uh, to some extent, of course, there are existing institutions that have, have this as part of their mandate, but have they been equipped to implement is another question, perhaps. The IMF, for example, has to some extent some of these mandates. They had the, the ambition, I think, under the former head as well as under the current to try to move in that direction. However, they don't have the means, basically, nor potentially the, the instrument, the right instruments to really do it. And it's unclear, I think, whether also the big powers would want them to have that sort of leverage and, and, and those means. But I do think they, to some extent, have it. I think in Europe and in parts of the Western world, I mean, another one is the Bank of International Settlements. I mean, they also, to some extent, have some of this mandate. Uh, but again, they haven't been fully leveraged to do it, I think. And this con discussion goes on, really, in terms of whether one really wants. Uh, and then the comment you made on causes of uh, fin illicit financial flows, I mean, is it linked to we should be raising up the issue, is it linked to that the tax burdens are too high uh, in some other countries they are escaping from? I think to some extent there, it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion, but I think in many of the countries I have worked, I was five years in Zambia, I worked mainly on the issue of mining and extractives, the similar in Tanzania. And I don't think necessarily there, for example, the issue was that the tax burden was overly high, to be honest. I mean, it's much higher in many other comparable countries. In fact, when I came, they were at the global bottom when it came to effective tax rates on the mining. But still, they didn't collect practically anything in mining tax. So it's, it's uh, a race to the bottom, unfortunately, a bit we are talking about here, because of course, if the alternative is zero rate, then, you know, I mean, where, where, where is really, I mean, I think the crux of the matter here is that no one really wants, and of course, the shareholders want the company leadership to minimize their tax, their tax expenses. So as long as you have this, as long as you are unable to put restrictions and to regulate differently, both at the global level, and not to forget also at the national level, because we haven't talked that much about it, but it's actually possible also to do a lot of things at the national level. Some countries do much better including my own country, Norway, does very well in terms of taxing petroleum. And many countries actually, in the case of petroleum, manage to get a hold of a very large share of the revenue. But the issue is more how it's used. I mean, Nigeria is an example where they don't manage. But actually, I've been looking and I'm doing currently a study as part of my PhD work on this. And there's a large difference between mining and petroleum. So. So the, the question here is a bit, yeah, is the tax burden too high? Is that why they escape? It's a bit of a dangerous discussion, I think, also, because if you can have zero, of course, obviously, you would be pushed by your shareholders and your, and your owners and your management to, to go as close to zero as possible, as the big ones do. 
Um, and then on the inequality, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I didn't, I was a bit imprecise and juggled the way I described these things. I, I wasn't implying in any way, actually, that uh, inequality in Brazil had gone up. Uh, I think it's clear that it has gone up in Europe. It has gone up in US for several decades. Uh, I think it's clear that, yes, at the global level, because of China especially and a few other countries, there is some sort of uh, equalization happening. But if you look within the countries, uh, there are huge challenges of inequality, also in the ones that are very successful, like China. Uh, and still Brazil, I mean, even if the last decade you saw some progress, and Professor Nora Lustig and others have documented that this is not just Brazil, but parts of Latin America, still the levels of inequality are very high. Um, so, you know, uh, yes, I mean, it's very good, I think, concrete policies that led to this, and a lot of effort from Brazilian government and Brazilian people to historically then, for almost the first time, reduce inequality. Uh, still, there is a long way to go. So I think, and that, I mean, coming again, having worked in Africa, there are huge challenges linked to inequality. And we know that it's not, that it's not uh, anymore. Some economists had argued earlier that this was part of the expected path and that you have to sort of settle with that inequality has to be high. And somehow, sometimes also, it would be good for growth. I think at least this discussion is over. Now, even the IMF and others have now come out with reports saying that, no, there is empirical evidence showing clearly that if you do invest in reducing inequality in efficient ways, it's both good for development on the social side and good for your growth rates. So you have this now for the Western world and for developing countries. So um, this was the point there. And then on the on the discussion on the BRICS and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just throwing out some ideas here. I, I, I don't really know too much about it. I agree with, with, with my colleague who was saying that this is, is really at the international level is very difficult how to, how to deal with these issues. Um, and, but I do, I, I, I think I will go back to saying also that I do think Brazil and also other developing economies can do a lot more at the domestic level. Uh, and, and I think actually that this whole issue of the financialization of industry and the derivative issue, it's actually not unsolvable at the national level. I would actually insist that it can be dealt with uh, to some extent, not solved fully. Let me give you one example from Africa, and that is that in most countries in Africa, and it might be the same here as well, when you deal with the balance sheets of multinationals that do mining or petroleum activities, normally, for example, derivative activities are allowed in the tax accounts. Now, why do you allow it? I mean, you open the playing field for speculation and for abuse. Uh, you could simply do, as was done in Zambia at some point, although it was later reversed because the president died, there was a new government coming in, and policies were reversed. We simply put it out of the regular core mining tax uh, legislation and dealt with it separately. What did that mean? The mining companies were up in arms about this because for the first time they could not write off huge fake losses that they did through derivative actions in their core balance sheet that was reported to the tax authorities in Zambia. What did it mean? It meant that suddenly they have huge surpluses that had to be, they had to pay tax, supposedly. They managed to negotiate, the president died, and then, yeah, it's a long story, and I've written a paper about that as well that is available on the net. But uh, I think you can actually regulate for certain industries and for parts of the economy to avoid part of the issue with the derivative and other sorts of financialization of the economy. So I agree, that's why you, the issue of regulation, you need to actually have tough regulation and to separate between these different elements, to not let it uh, erode your tax base to such an extent. It's possible to do, it has been done in several countries. It's not impossible. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me get first to, I think, what is the, the really biggest question which was raised by Paulo, uh, which is, well, I am quite pessimistic. Do I think that uh, there is any solution at hand, 
And my answer for that is, well, not really. Why? Because it's not a technical problem. In terms of uh, technicalities, I think I, I mentioned some elements which I'm not saying that is easy, but you can figure out. The, uh, for example, much less financial globalization than what we have today. How do you do that? You use much more capital controls as a key tool on your macro financial management. You close down fiscal shelters or you impose tremendous restrictions on, on, on them. Uh, you get tax authorities to really interact on a daily basis and that, that can be done today. On ele with electronic platforms, you can do it domestically and internationally. All those things can be done from a purely technical perspective. What is the problem? Political. It's a problem of political will. The elites, which would be the ones capable of managing that, managing, not solving completely, but managing that problem, getting, getting it to a much better, I don't know, plateau, they are part of the problem. They're, they're almost all involved with this. So it's very complicated. Uh, There's a very complicated issue to change the political will that would enable the technical solutions to happen. That's why I think that uh, I, I, I always scratch my head in thinking about that not disagreeing with, with, with you that, yes, some countries do much better than other countries. Yes. Okay. Singapore, for example, is the best example that you can really do much better in all those things. One of the reasons being they are the best bureaucracy in the world. And why is that? Among other things, they are very well respected. They get a very nice salary, they get tenure, but on the other hand, if they mess up, they go to jail right away. And they can do it. So yes, it's possible. They, they have a truly Weberian, Weberian kind of bureaucracy. And that works. But if you have the reverse, then it's very difficult because you, you're already handicapped when, when you begin with, when, when, you, when you, you build your public infrastructure to deal with those problems, you're already handicapped. If you start by saying the state is part of the problem, not of the solution, you're already you already lost the battle. Just to get like two very quick observations, your your uh, Robert, in terms of the the idea that illicit capital flows, that you, you were not very satisfied with the explanation for them, right? And I think that the explanation for them it's really easy. It's like why do you have illicit capital flows growing and growing and growing? Because they can. Because all the conditions are there for them. So would you rather, if, you, if you're a corporation or a very wealthy individual, etc., and you have the opportunity of paying, and then, I, I, again, I don't think the tax burden is a big problem. Because if I can choose, am I going to pay 50% tax, 10% tax, or zero tax? I would say what? Well, zero tax. If I know that I can do it, I will pay zero tax. So I, I will do it. If, it. if it became so easy to do it, then it really does not depend on the tax burden in itself. It depends on the incentives and the easiness that you can do it. If, on the other hand, you post a lot of fences and you control much more money in, money out, and you identify who is doing what, then it becomes more complicated. But th that's not the world we're living in. And just like the uh, one, one, uh, one bit of, a, of an observation that I, I, I can't resist uh, just mentioning, because this appeared more than once already uh, in the morning and, and now, in, in terms, for example, of, OK, uh, one of the, the good things that uh, if we're able to curtail uh, illicit capital flows, would be, for example, we would have uh, a lot of money to invest in infrastructure that is so so badly needed. Again, we don't need. It would be great 
to contain illicit capital flows, but we don't have investment in infrastructure, at least here in Brazil, because there's only one institution that does it. It's called the NDS, the Banco Nacional de Desenvolvimento Econômico. And private finance, private financial institutions don't do it. Why they don't do it? Again, because they can, because of their portfolio preferences, short-term portfolio preference. They can make a ton of money not putting one dollar in infrastructure investment. Why would they, if they are able to profit immensely without doing it? So again, regulations and incentives. I think this is the name of the game. Thank you. I guess uh, we are about time to finish the session. I, I would like to thank both uh, speakers uh, and the attention of the audience. And now I, we make a break for the next section. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.